Good day, everyone. Welcome again to the Wings Radio program, where we hope you will be uplifted and encouraged by what you hear. We want to inspire you through Christ to find the power of God's Word to the challenging times in your lives. Be sure to visit the blog page for prophetic words, updates, and godly inspiration at www.wingsofprophecy.com. Now here's your host, Glenda Linkus. Hello, believers. Welcome to the Wings Radio Show. I'm your host, Glenda Linkus, and today we're continuing our series, Hindrances on the Pathway to Promotion, Tests from the Life of Joseph. Today, we're going to talk about test number nine. There's one more test after this. This test is the glory test, and I want to read to you from Acts chapter 12. Now, about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth... Now, this is talking about Herod Agrippa the I, y'all. When Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out, and followed him. And wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. He thought he was just having a dream or a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city which openeth to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then they said, It is his angel. Because they thought that probably Peter had already been executed, maybe. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with a hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go shew these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers, what what was become of Peter. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea, and there abode, and Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. But they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus the king's chamberlain their friend, desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. He gave a speech. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a god, not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. You know, the the angel that smote him with the worms might have been the same angel that let Peter out of prison. We don't know. Now, I did some research on this. And I'm going to read you the historical account of this from uh, the uh, 
Antiquities of the Jews, written by Josephus, the historian. But I also looked up the worms in the original language. Those are maggots. That is so disgusting to think about. But those were maggots that he was eaten by. And they're the same type of worms as in Mark 9.44 where it says, when it's talking about hell, and it says, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Okay, let me read you the same story from the, histori- the history book, the Jewish Antiquities. When Agrippa had reigned three years over all Judea, he came to the city of Caesarea, which was formerly called Stratos Tower, and there he exhibited shows in honor of Caesar. Upon his being informed that there was a certain festival celebrated to make vows for his safety. At this festival, a great multitude was gotten together of the principal persons and such as were of dignity through his province. So the big guys, the important people were there. On the second day of these shows, he put on a garment made wholly of silver and of a contexture truly wonderful and came into the theater early in the morning at which time the silver of his garment being illuminated by the fresh reflection of the sun's rays upon it shone out after a surprising manner and was so resplendent as to spread amazement over those that looked intently upon him. And presently his flatterers cried out, one one from one place and another from another, though not for his good, that he was a god. And they added, Be you merciful to us, for although we have as yet reverenced you only as a man, Yet shall we henceforth own you as superior to moral nature. In other words, we've only seen you as a man before, but now we see you're a god. Upon this, the king did neither rebuke them nor reject their impious flattery. But as he presently afterwards looked up, he saw an owl sitting on a certain rope over his head. Now, Eusebius, another historian, does not say that there was an owl over his head. In that way, those two disagree. But... A severe pain also arose in his belly and began in a most violent manner. He therefore looked upon his friends and said, I, whom you call a God, am commanded presently to depart this life. Anyway, he goes on, uh, it goes on that he died five days later. So, of course, Josephus does not say an angel smote him because he wouldn't have known that being a historian. The glory test is the test of whether you will accept the credit for something that is clearly done by God or by his anointing. Let's say that um, let's say that you're called to a healing ministry. And let's say one day God tells you to go pray for somebody or you just decide to pray for someone and you lay hands on them and they're miraculously healed. Let's say they're raised off their deathbed and it's a, or raised from the dead and it's a huge miracle. And people start just honoring you and giving you glory and all this. You have to make a choice. Are you going to take that honor and say, oh, yes, I, you know, I'm very righteous, blah, 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 you know, whatever. I'm the great prophetess, bishop, you know, whatever, whatever, apostle, whatever. Stick all those titles on your name and, and let them honor you. Or are you going to say, no, it was not me. It was the power of God. And I was just the person fortunate enough to get to witness the miracle. That's the glory test. Now, think about this. You know, every spring, all the Hollywood stars get together for the Academy Awards, right? They get all dressed up and, you know, they, who, whoever has the biggest name in Hollywood gets first pick of all the designer gowns and all that sort of thing. And they don't go through the back door, y'all. They go through the front door, go up through, you know, the red carpet, walk real slow so the cameras can get lots of pictures of how glorious they look. Talk to the reporters and, all of this to be noticed, to be glorified, okay? And if we are not careful, if we sit and watch the TV all the time and stuff like that, you can start glorifying them too without realizing it, okay? And what about the people who feel the need to stick five titles on their name to be sure that nobody overlooks the gifts that they believe they operate in or the anointings that they feel they walk in? What about those who refuse to be seated at events with the let's call them common people, since they are so special, they must have special seating or they just cannot bear to stay. I have heard tell of folks that were invited to speak on shows like on the TBN network who were offended by the place they were asked to sit backstage. Can you imagine? I personally cannot imagine that you could be invited to to speak on a network that's worldwide for the glory of God 
and you have a problem with the chair they sit you in backstage, that you think that much of yourself, you think you're that great and you're that mighty and you're there to speak for God, you're supposed to be glorifying Him, not yourself. Can I just say that? Contrast that with Jesus. To the man healed of leprosy in Matthew 8, he said, See that you don't tell anyone. Go and tell nobody. To the two blind men that he healed in Matthew chapter 9, he warned them and said, See that nobody knows about this. In Mark 1, a demon-possessed man in Capernaum yelled out, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus replied, Shut up. Not really. He didn't say shut up. He said, Be quiet. Jesus often chose not to be in the limelight. In fact... Most of his ministry happened outside the capital city of Jerusalem, away from the pomp and the ceremony of the Pharisees and the temple and all that kind of thing. Listen to this from Philippians chapter 2. If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. That means to think more highly of other people than you do of yourself. And it didn't say just important people, y'all. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Don't be just thinking about yourself all the time. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now remember what it says in Matthew 23. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. Talking about the Pharisees. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And love the uppermost rooms at feast and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. In other words, you all have the same boss and you're all brothers. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. That means brought down. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. In other words, let's don't go giving ourselves titles. Don't exalt yourself or you force God's hand to humble you because he is bound by his word. Do you all hear me? I have lived this. If you have read my books, you know it. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So if you get into pride, destruction is going to follow quick on your heels. And if you get a haughty spirit and you're looking down on everybody else, you're going to get a fall. Okay? The only time that Jesus exalted himself at any degree at all whatsoever was the event that we know as the triumphal entry. The day that we celebrate each year as Palm Sunday when Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem being proclaimed as Messiah on a donkey and he had to do that to fulfill the prophecies I'm going to read y'all a story it's called the right perspective and you know taking God's glory or trying to take credit for the gifts that are in you that God placed there that he owns not you he owns is all a matter of perspective. You've got to remember whose those are. A man was walking through an art gallery when he came upon a picture of the Lord Jesus dying upon the cross. He stopped and looked at the beautiful portrait of Calvary's love. And he, as he stared into the face of Christ so full of agony, the gallery guard tapped him on the shoulder. Lower, the guard said. The artist painted this picture to be appreciated from a lower position. So the man bent down, and from this lower position, he observed new beauties in the picture not previously shown. Lower, said the guard, lower still. The man knelt down on one knee and looked up into the face of Christ. The new vantage point yielded yet new beauties to behold and appreciate. But motioning with his torch toward the ground, the guard said, lower, you've got to go lower. The man now dropped down to two knees and looked up. Only then, as he looked up at the painting, 
from such a low posture could he realize the artist's intended perspective. Only then could he see the full beauty of the cross. Is that not also true with us when we worship? Only when we position ourselves lower and lower in humility can we behold more fully the true glory of our Lord. When you are busy standing, trying to get others to notice you, to appreciate you and see how special you are, to see how anointed you are, you cannot see the true beauty of Christ because it is on our knees, even on our face, that we truly encounter him. In 2001 or 2002, I studied the word worship in the Old Testament, and I found that it means, in addition to worshiping, to lay prostrate. It means to serve, to give. Who is your God? The Bible tells us in no uncertain terms, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. When a man starts believing, or a woman, that he is more important than anything or anyone, he becomes a God unto himself. We all know people like this. Okay? Herod listened to the roar of the crowd, not to his heart. And he became consumed in that moment of notoriety. His 15 seconds of fame cost him everything, y'all. And many are being deceived every day and misled by the grandness of others, whether it's because of their wealth, their name, their status in life. And we have to wake up and realize that God is not pleased with these actions. God tells us not to get caught up in the things of the world. Movies, music, and television shows that are an offense to God should be an offense to his children. Don't allow yourself to make a God of destruction. Wide is the road, and wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many there be that find it. Come out from them and be separated. It's not popular to be separate, but in the end, there will be a lot of people who wish that they would have been separate. We are a peculiar people. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to have different standards. We are a people with a king above all kings, a people chosen by God to inherit the world and the kingdom of God. We are Christians, y'all. We need to start being a separate people like we're commanded to do. Can we clean the other gods out of our houses and get back to glorifying God and not ourselves and not movie stars and celebrities and the latest politician? Come on now. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Let me tell you another story. This is a true story about a German artist named Albrecht Dürer in one of his famous drawings, The Praying Hands. This is so beautiful. I've probably read it on here before, but it's worth reading again. Durer's father was a goldsmith and apprenticed him in his early years to learn the family trade. But Durer loved painting and really wanted to be a painter. So his father finally gave in and agreed that he could go to Nuremberg to study art. Unfortunately, though, his father was not wealthy enough to support him, so he had to work as a laborer to support himself. The trouble was, this left him little time to work on his art. Now he had, he had a friend... Franz Nigstein, who was also a gifted artist in, in the same boat, so they decided that they'd draw lots, and one would support the other while he finished his studies, and then he'd support the other out of his earnings as an artist. They drew lots, and Albrecht won, so Albrecht was able to devote himself to his art studies, but he agreed to support Franz after achieving success so his friend could finish his studies, too. Some years later, Albrecht returned to find Franz so he could keep his end of the bargain. But when he got there, he discovered what a sacrifice his friend had made for him. You see, as Franz had worked at his labor, his his fingers had become twisted and stiff. His long, slender fingers and sensitive hands had been ruined for life. He could no longer manage the delicate brush strokes so necessary for executing fine paintings. But in spite of the price he had paid, Franz wasn't bitter. He was happy that his friend Albrecht had attained success. One day, Albrecht saw his friend kneeling, his rough hands entwined in silent prayer. Albrecht quickly sketched the hands, later using the sketch to create the drawing, the praying hands. He saw his friend's hands as a symbol of the sort of love that Jesus had shown us, a self-giving love that preferred the good of the loved one to its own rights. 
a self-emptying love that chose servanthood over equality with God in the glory of heaven. How rare is that? Our job is to fellowship with the Lord, to adore Him, to worship Him, and to do whatever He would have us to do for the glory of His kingdom, to serve others, to give, to do whatever He wants us to do. We are not here to build our kingdoms. We are here to build His We are not here to honor our name. We are here to honor his name. If you have been building yours and honoring your name, I would encourage you to meditate on some of the scriptures I have mentioned. Because if you continue to exalt yourself, God will be bound by his holy word to humble you, and it is not fun. You will flunk the glory test, and not only will you not be promoted, you will be demoted. Can I just tell you that? Don't try to take God's glory. He freely gives us very much, but he does not share his glory with anyone. The ends of those who make themselves to be gods is not good. Herod was eaten by maggots, and Pharaoh was drowned in the Red Sea. That's just two examples. Pass the glory test and stay promotable. If you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, he will exalt you in due time. When he knows you won't get stuck on yourself over it, When you can be trusted with promotion, not to become prideful or try to make it all about you. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. God bless you as you walk forth this week. Thanks for listening. Y'all have a great week. Thank you so much for tuning in to hear Glenda Linkus on Wings Radio. We hope that you've been encouraged and inspired in your daily walk with Christ. You can find more of Glenda's talks on her YouTube channel, Texas Author and the Number One. You can contact Glenda by email at wingsofprophecy at gmail.com or by mail at Glenda Linkus P.O. Box 127 Princeton, Texas 75407 Wings Radio is a non-denominational program and is not affiliated with any other church or non-profit organization. Have you ever gone through a time in your life where suddenly it just felt like your whole life was falling apart? I call these experiences the wilderness experiences. Wilderness experiences are a time of great uncertainty and change. Uh, There are times when our faith is tried and refined. After many experiences, the Lord spoke to me to write The Wilderness Companion, which is a virtual roadmap through the desert times of your life. Find out why you've been led to the wilderness. Find out what the biggest hindrance is to receiving provision in the wilderness. Find out what the seven temptations of the wilderness are. Drastically cut the time you spend in the wilderness by learning how to partner with the Lord instead of working against Him. Every Christian needs to read The Wilderness Companion. It's by Glenda Lomax and it's available on Amazon.com or WingsOfProphecy.com.
Amazon.com, The Wilderness Companion by Glenda Lomax. Have occasional strong urges to do the wrong thing? Things that mess up an otherwise Christian lifestyle? Is the sin nature rearing up or could it be something else? Spiritual soul tunnels are well-disguised avenues to reach a person who has turned from a formerly unhealthy relationship. If this sounds like it could describe you, you need Glenda Linko's new ebook, Severing Soul Ties and Leaving the Past Behind. For $3.99 at Amazon and WingsofProphecy.com, that's Severing Soul Ties and Leaving the Past Behind.